And um, it's always, yeah, it's always wonderful to be back here. Um, we were just talking earlier, Chris and I, about the first time that I spoke at a Foresight event, which was in 2003, when hardly anyone knew about this stuff outside of the futurist community. But as Chris mentioned earlier, um, the idea of damage repair as a concept for um, going after aging and keeping people healthy late in life was something that um, was already mentioned um, uh, um, two decades earlier in Engines of Creation. So um, this is the right community for me to be talking to. And for that reason, I will certainly not give my standard talk for the few of you in the audience who are not familiar with my work. Um, you know, I refer you to YouTube where there are well over 100 videos of my standard talk. I'm going to talk about the kind of thing that we need to be focusing on this community. And Really, I'm going to be talking about foresight. I'm going to be talking about something that we need to be foreseeing and warning people of and making happen. So, um, to, hello, talk to me. Talk to me. Why isn't the space working? There we go. I'll do. Um, oh, hang on, the slide missing. That's, I'll do. Uh, yeah, so, um, so as you all know, uh, we can't treat aging because it's too complicated, and we can't prevent aging because... The being alive is too complicated, but we can have a kind of sweet spot between the two, the damage repair approach, which essentially separates the lifelong process of creation of damage in the body from the late life process of going downhill as a result of having more damage than what the body is set up to tolerate. And that's all very well, but the um, question is, how do we do it? And the real breakthrough that allowed me to start getting quite... Um, uh, vocal about this nearly 20 years ago was the realization that we could um, describe a taxonomy of the damage that we wanted to repair. And this taxonomy is, of course, a very major simplification of what's going on. There are many, many, many different types of damage, but the purpose of the taxonomy is to demonstrate that there is a small number, a manageable number, of generic therapies that we have the possibility to develop, each of which may take slightly different forms for different examples within the corresponding category of damage, but each of which is fundamentally a, a single idea, a single conceptual approach. And of course, Sense Research Foundation has been pursuing all of these things um, for a long time now, and it's very gratifying that we've made a lot of progress. Uh, now, talk to me. Okay. Um, yeah, so as you probably remember, um, those of you who've been around for a long time, uh, this was not all that um, readily accepted by my colleagues within the biology of aging at the beginning. Uh, indeed, it was rather roundly um, dismissed by almost everybody. Uh, but over the years, as I was able to explain better and better what um, we were really talking about here, it became so mainstream and orthodox that in this decade, it's starting to be reinvented by other people, um, pretending it's original, kind of. Um, so this is a paper, just uh, the most pr prominent example, which was published six years ago, and it's going to be by a long distance the most highly cited paper in the whole of the biology of aging this decade, and it's absolutely the same idea. So that's wonderful. That battle is won. That battle is, you know, it's done. But there's more. So what I've got here is a slide taken from my TED talk from 2006, and slightly tidied up to compensate for the not completely perfect backwards compatibility of PowerPoint. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, said that, I used to say this kind of thing. This was in my standard talk back then. And what I was pointing out was that actually the problem is not really the scientists. Scientists may have, uh, some of them may have attacked me rather heavily in the recent past at this point, but the fact is I'm not having any trouble convincing the world leading scientists who are specialists in the areas that need to be focused on that actually if, I could, if only I could pay them to do the work I want them to do, they would totally do it. They were hard to trot. And the problem was really the stasis formed by these three communities, the people who basically do the work, the people who allocate the money to do the work, and the people who decide who are the people who allocate the money to do the work. And they, you know, they affect each other in this way. And essentially the reason why I chose to set up a research organization as an independent, non-profit, overwhelmingly funded by philanthropy, was that that way we could escape all of this. 
But now, look closely at this diagram. This is really not just one triangular log jam. This is an amalgamation of two triangular log jams, one that goes by a gerontologist voters' government and one that goes by a gerontologist shareholders' industry. And those two things have actually evolved very differently over the past decade. We are now in the, we are now in the rather gratifying situation where a lot of the projects that we at Sense Research Foundation have been pursuing over these years we no longer are because we've been able to spin them out into startup companies. And of course, that means that they've got much more money than they had before. We've been, it's very, very much easier to persuade people with deep pockets to uh, take an investment opportunity, even if it's a really, really high risk, high reward one, rather than to just give money away. So that's fantastic. And of course, it's by no means the whole story. We've also got the wonderful fact that a huge number of companies have, a, a, have arisen aligned with us um, that are doing very much damage repair centric stuff. And, you know, I just totally can't keep up anymore. I totally, I'm totally underwater. Look at the bottom line here. The, uh, one of, one of the uh, more active investors in this field, Carl Flager, did the enormously valuable public service very recently of creating a website listing all of the companies that are doing important stuff in this space and um, uh, you know, just you know, a couple of lines about them. Um, and so I recommend you all to have a look at that. But, you know, it's growing like topsy. It's insane. So what does that leave? Well, um, if you look at the title of my talk as it was written in the program, you will see that it says, I think, how we can reach longe longevity escape velocity for m most people alive today. Now, that's not quite what I normally say. Normally, what I ask is the question, how can we achieve longevity escape velocity in time for most people alive today? And there's a subtle distinction there. Achieving it in time for people alive today basically you know, puts the emphasis on the science, on the development of these medicines. Achieving it for people alive today talks about not only the science, but also the dissemination of the therapies once they have been developed. And what I want to emphasize in the last few minutes of my time here is that this is now our main job. At the bottom here, I'm saying the third wave is political understanding, and it's the most difficult one. Now, political understanding is what I'm emphasizing here. This is not the other half of that triangular logjam I was mentioning, which is all about political action, actually spending taxpayers' money and, you know, doing stuff like that. The thing is... That is still a problem that needs to be solved, and it's being really slow. As we all know, there's a huge number of um, you know, arguments that people use to try to deflect the idea of, of um, defeating aging with medicine and to try to pretend that aging is a blessing in disguise and so on. And you know, It's very frustrating, but it still remains the fact that people are just not willing to let go of their fear of getting their hopes up that will change. That will change. And that is the point. We don't know when it's going to change, but it could change rather soon. So, as you all know, or most of you know anyway, uh, there's a concept here, longevity escape velocity, which I introduced a long time ago, around the same time Ray Kurzweil said more or less the same thing. His phrase was, living long enough to live forever. The idea is basically that Damage repair has the wonderful quality that it buys us time, which means that we can progressively improve the effectiveness of therapies so as to stay one step ahead of the problem and have an impact on the aging of people alive today that is equivalent to having absolutely perfect therapies within only, uh, from the beginning, you know, let's say within a couple of decades from now, uh, when in fact we probably will never have perfect therapies, we'll, we, we'll just increasingly um, approach that point. Uh, so that's fine, and it does mean that people are going to live an awfully long time. But the thing that people are not looking at is what I'm showing you here. Yes, we don't know how long this is going to be. I think my current estimate of a 50-50 probability is 17 years, but it's still the case, as it was 20 years ago, that there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 100 years if we come across lots of, un lots of unexpected problems. But here's the thing. Look at the bottom line. This decade... I would say with at least 50-50 probability within the next five years, there is going to be sufficient progress in the laboratory, as well as in the clinic, but I believe that the most important progress will be still in mice, sufficient progress that it will become safe for other 
experts in the biology of aging, not just me, to get up on stage and on camera and say, yeah, you know, we're getting there. It's only a matter of time before we actually lick this aging thing. At the moment, it's not safe. You remember that out of the small number, like a dozen experts on the biology of aging who do a lot of public speaking and so on, I am the only one who has never had to sell his soul to the tyranny of peer review. I'm the only one who has this independence by virtue of the foundation. Everybody else has to w worry about whether someone's going to torpedo their next grant application on the basis that they said something irresponsible that got people's hopes up, right? I don't have that problem. So, but that's going to change awfully soon. And when it does, we're going to be in a very different situation. So remember this phrase, anticipation of anticipation. If these therapies are coming really soon, then fine. But they're not coming all that soon. I think we are still 15, 20 years away. But the anticipation of the therapies by the general public is coming soon. And it is that anticipation that is going to be the point when the shit really hits the fan. If you think about a situation in which less than five years from now, in an in a, in a instant, literally in a period of about a week, half of the developed world is going to shift from an expectation that they will live only slightly longer than their parents did into an expectation that they're going to live far longer than anyone has ever lived before. Now, it's not, it doesn't take very much, very much time for people like us to see that you know, that's going to be a bit of a dislocation. People are going to want different health care systems, different health insurance, different life insurance, different pensions, different inheritance arrangements, everything. The big ticket items are going to change overnight. Now, from the point of view of a policymaker, a decision maker, someone who can actually influence public policy, what does that mean? It means they'd bloody better have thought about it in advance. So I believe that one of the biggest things that this community can do, and within this room we have people with a lot of influence, people like Tom Khalil, people like Jim O'Neill, who I should probably mention has come in as our interim CEO for a little while. Um, people with a lot of political clout in one way or another need to be going out and telling, telling politicians this thing. Uh, no, I've been telling people for a long time that the things that they think are the problems with all of this are actually mis misguided. They are not problems. And reassuring people, you know, telling people, oh, no, you don't need to worry about dictators living forever. But that's not what we should be focusing on now. We should be focusing on telling people that there is a problem that they're not thinking of. So I'll stop there. Thank you. OK, one question. One question. Hi, Aubrey. <laughs> My name is Ira Brightman. I represent a meetup.com group, the Health and Life Extension Movement. Um, Aubrey has already cast his vote for what he thinks is the best name for the movement. We're trying to organize the movement so it has one name, one main goal, and we can get massive amounts of money into the research. Uh, it's meetup.com, <clears throat> the Health and Life Extension Movement. My question is, to everybody in the room, how many will agree to at least go to the, go to the uh, website, meetup.com, the Health and Life Extension Movement, and at least take a look at it. Please raise your hand. Thank you. Meetup.com, the Health and Life Extension Movement. <laughs>